The USA has always been known as the land of plenty, a place of wealth and opportunity. Yet for Americans, things have hit rock bottom, with the situation looking almost as bad as it did in the 1930s Depression era. The American middle class would be considered well off by European standards. Their yearly income is between $40,000 and $120,000. And yet they are struggling more than anyone else in the US to meet their daily living expenses. Family incomes have taken a huge hit over the last three years. So this has been a really rough you know, 11 years for the typical family in this country. And it came on after 30 years of, of people just hanging on. The middle class is being wiped out in the United States. It's becoming what was the working class in the 19th or 18th centuries. Basically people who, as long as they are working, can stay alive. But when they stop to work, they stop working, they have no wealth, they have no assets. We don't really have a, a rainy day fund. We don't have a, a lot of savings. I always prioritize, okay, these are the bills that we have to pay, and these are the bills that if we get the money, we can pay them. <laughs> we had to borrow money for our daughter's education. We're scrambling around our son's education. We've struggled. I mean, we've gone from having money in the bank, having savings, to living paycheck to paycheck and basically trying to make ends meet, and sometimes they don't meet. With over one million inhabitants, Boston is one of the largest cities in the United States. But the middle class are being forced out. Property prices here are far too high for the average American family. This is the home of the Cox family. Husband Jonas works for a software company. His wife is in publishing. After the birth of their first child, Jonas's wife stayed at home for a year. Without a second income, the family nearly went through all their savings. A few months later, Jonas lost his job. Although he was only unemployed for four months, the family savings are gone, and they are now deeply in debt. We, we tend not to talk about our financial lives. We tend to keep it pretty private. Uh, both my wife and I, I think, have been that way, even in my family. Like the Cox family, three quarters of all Americans are so out of pocket that their monthly income is not enough to maintain their debts, let alone feeding their family and putting a roof over their heads. My wife and I earn about $120,000 a year. I don't think uh, I, I spend money frivolously. I, I'm getting down to the, just the, really the daily routine. I, um, I, I, I make lunch for myself every day. I, um, I never buy lunches. Uh, we very rarely go to restaurants to eat out. I go a long time without buying clothes, um, maybe more so than I would like to. The middle class is defined as people who have a set of aspirations. Those aspirations being, I want to have, I want to own my own house. I want to live in a safe neighborhood with good schools. I want to be able to put away a little bit of money for taking a modest vacation every year. I want to have health insurance. I want to be able to save a little for retirement. I want to be able to send my kids to college. Those, those sorts of things that make up what I would call the middle class basket. Traveling north from Boston is a bleak journey through the old industrial towns of New England. Their heyday has long since passed. Textile manufacturing was outsourced many years ago to third world countries offering cheaper labor. Vermont, near the Canadian border, has always been a popular tourist spot. Its many ski resorts and stable weather conditions have made it famous for its winter sports. Yet on a day like today, a clear day with plenty of snow, the slopes are almost empty.
Within the villages of Vermont, you can still find the old American spirit. Neighbors trust each other, front doors always stay unlocked. Here you find people that still treasure the original pioneering ideals. Hard-working yet wayward free thinkers. People that want to live in harmony with nature and are conscious of their environment. Six years ago, George Schenck and his wife went into the forest and cut down some trees from which they built this log cabin and made it their home. Even for frugal people like the Schenks, times have been better. There are no promises about the future. You can plan and hope for the kind of economic future you dream of, but that may not happen. The Shanks have been producing American flatbread for over 30 years. Of uh, a classic artisanal bread. This is our homemade organic tomato sauce. The couple own a restaurant. They have franchises in other American towns and also own a range of frozen food. Vermont mozzarella cheese. They also deliver their flatbread to schools and prisons. They were doing well and were hoping to retire soon, but along came the credit crunch and crunched their retirement plans with it. I'm feeling a little squeezed. I feel uh, that I'm getting to the age where I sh when I grew up, my parents were um, retiring when they were, um, let's not talk about that age, but <laughs> they were retiring in their 60s. And where, from where I'm sitting, I don't see, I don't see the end of my work. The couple had to use their pension funds in order to send their children to university. It is a tough decision to make between the children's education and retirement funds, yet it is one that many average American families simply have to make these days. But George doesn't want to complain, and the last thing he wants is pity. He maintains that even when times are tough, you still have to focus on the positive effects. One of the things that's been fascinating about the recession, which we seem to be coming out of, is that it created a pause for a lot of people to reevaluate. Are, are they doing the things that, that really matter in their lives? Um, do they really need or want the things that they thought were so important? You know, one of the things I think that we, as a takeaway here, is that you can feel richer if you want less. When Reagan came into office, we were the world's largest creditor. We loaned money to other people. We were the largest exporter, manufacturer, and exporter of finished goods in the world that the world had ever seen. We made things. We were the largest importer of raw materials. So we brought in iron ore, we made it into television sets and computers, and we exported it uh, for credit. And the, the very definition of a first world country. 30 years later, all of those numbers are absolutely upside down. We are now the world's largest debtor in the history of the, of the planet. We are the world's largest importer of manufactured goods and exporter of raw materials. A lot has changed since the 1960s when the wife stayed at home to bring up the children whilst her husband went out to work. Today, both husband and wife have to bring in an income, and even that is sometimes not enough to make ends meet. The idea that people spend much more now than before is a myth. The costs of living, education, and health care have risen exorbitantly, yet wages haven't increased at the same pace. So what has changed in the past two generations to make this the case? On this farm in Vermont, three generations are living under one roof. For the people in Vermont, Washington and its politics are very far away. The political opinions of the Lincoln family are very diverse. The experience of life on their farm has been very different for each generation. I think it was much easier for my parents to make a, um, I don't know if you call it a profit, I would call it pay the bills. And we were in a situation, so the farm and my mother worked out, but the, they, my parents put all five of us kids through college. I don't know if a farmer with five children today could put them through college. 
when I think about um, Grandma and Gramp, I mean, they. How many times did Gramp leave the farm? Never. He never left. I mean, I was All in did work. in seventh or eighth grade, and Gramp left the farm for four days, and we went to Washington D.C. Farmers across Vermont are suffering from financial pressures. And right now, there are people who um, are under extreme stress. I, I mean, no, you can't believe hundreds of thousands of dollars in in millions of dollars in debt and hundreds of thousands of dollars going behind. Yet the Lincoln family don't want any help from the government. If I'm a good person in business, it's my responsibility to create an environment that I don't need to be subsidized. I think the true Vermonters, the true old-time Vermonters, and we've got two sick coming here, they don't need a safety net. They can adapt to the, to the environment they're living in and they create an environment that's economically sustainable to them. It's, this is, uh, it's always been show you how to do it and take it. This farm would not survive both of us working on it. I think I have to work outside the house. And I think that's for health insurance for all of us. When we got engaged that this ring was a good investment because it paid back. The health insurance that I saved <laughs> paid for the ring in less than one year. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Although farmers are struggling, this family business is surviving for now. The Lincolns have come up with other sources of income. These days, they are undertaking forestry operations for other businesses. On the other side of America from Vermont, right by the Mexican border, lies the state of Arizona. An average American city, it has many fast food chains along the outskirts. All are suffering from lack of customers. Okay. The property market in Arizona is on the verge of collapse. Nowhere else in America have so many people lost their houses through repossession, mostly because the property owners were unable to pay off their credit card debts. Okay, Tinker, let me show you this home that is bank-owned, foreclosed. First of all, the fountain normally would be flowing. Estate agent Jennifer O'Brien shows us around a repossessed property. Superficially, the house seems to be in good order, but the previous owner dismantled everything she believed she could turn into cash. What the real estate agents have been doing for you know, hundreds of years, which is selling homes, you know, we're in the business of selling homes, the banks, let houses like this deteriorate. And they don't sell them in a timely fashion. And they continue to deteriorate. They like to be lived in. They like their toilets flushed, the water to be run, um, you know, the landscaping to be maintained. None of this is being done. They're managing these things that are assets, the banks are, but they're not, they see them as numbers, not as homes, not as the American dream. Jerry Abreu loathes the daily walk to the letterbox. He knows there will only be new invoices, which he is unable to pay. The businessman has lost $800,000 in the stock market, and as a consequence, his house. The investment of a lifetime, all gone. <laughs> they won't offer us it. It's frustrating. Um, I guess, you know, part of you feels like you failed, you know? You feel like... Uh, like you've dropped the ball, so to speak, you know, especially in my 40s, you know, I'm in my 40s now, and um, I was kind of hoping to have a pretty good nest egg set aside for my kids to go to college and for us to kind of, you know, look towards a retirement. And now it's kind of like starting over. In contrast, the banks got billions. It's not fair that the banks should get these guaranteed loans back because they were backed by foreign investors, because they were backed by people that are wealthy and, and these you know, real estate investment trusts that they, that they should be the ones to be okay and safe, yet I'm losing my home, I'm losing my business, I'm losing my job. 
you know, and, and here they are worried about whether or not these big publicly held companies are going to fail. Like so many of the white middle class, Jerry believes that Washington no longer represents the people's interests. He is increasingly inclined to sympathize with the conservative Tea Party as much as he dislikes their extremism and racist views. The ideas of the Tea Party appeal to a growing part of the discontented middle class who are longing to bring back the good times. They know intuitively that something's wrong. And I think the Tea Party movement, they know they are poorer than they should be. They know that they are at risk. They know that, that they and all their friends are six months away from disaster if they lose their jobs. I mean, genuine disaster. The sun windows. Yeah, the solar windows that keep the room warm planted. Yeah, and this was the house Jerry and his wife Kimia used to own. It is not easy for them to go back. It was the place where they wanted to bring up their children and grow old together. Once a family home, everything is now owned by the bank. I try not to go there, you know, but I do feel a little, you know, you know, sad to see it again, be strong and move forward. I didn't blink an eye about having a $500,000 loan on a house because that's what the typical cost of a home was back then. And now when I think about it, it's like, that's a half a million dollars. That's a lot of money that I'm promising and committing to paying over 30 years. And, um, you know, it, when my parents bought their first house, I think it was $18,000, you know, and I, <laughs> and how did it go from 18,000 in 1970s to 500,000, you know, 30 years later, it just doesn't make sense. The collapsing property market is only one symptom of the economic downturn affecting America's middle class. Companies are looking for short-term profit, a quick fix if you like. One of the easy ways is through health insurance. They now let the employees themselves pay for it. Another problem is the increased competition with China and other low-wage countries, as well as a lack of organizations like the unions. Only 7.5% of all Americans are union members. That puts the individual in a very vulnerable position. The weakening of the unions had already started during the Reagan presidency. Ronald Reagan took on the toughest union at the time, the air traffic controllers. He broke down the strike and set the tone for the future. Today, the decline of the unions continues. In Wisconsin, the Republican Governor Scott Walker made it his goal to break up the teachers' union, who were supporting Obama's democratic politics. In the United States, you have no right to uh, sick days off from your work. You have no rights to vacation. Uh, you are not guaranteed uh, you know, a strong pension from your employer. You are not guaranteed uh, health care from your employer. All of those things are taken for granted from people in other countries. By the United States, uh, this is something that we have less and less of, not more and more of. The gap between rich and poor is increasing rapidly. Right now, the top 1% of Americans own more wealth than the bottom 90%. And the top 1% of Americans own, earn more income than the bottom 50%. People think, yeah, OK, rising inequality is objectionable. But is it bad? Is it bad for the country? And um, one thing that I think is important to think of at the same time is what's going on with mobility. 
people aren't moving up and down the income scale. People are really stuck um, where they were born means that goes against core American values. That means that the this idea of people have equal opportunity, people have the opportunity to, to, to make their mark, to make their, their millions, um, it's, just, it's just not there. Many Americans have lost hope of change. Every month around 120,000 people are declared bankrupt. One such couple was Amy and Jeff Nisley. Jeff is working in middle management of a bank and Amy is a childminder. They don't want to say exactly how much they are earning, but it's only just enough to take their kids camping once a year. That is their only luxury. Uh, bankruptcy was really our only option that we felt we could go with from the research we had done, the people we had talked to. Uh, so we didn't want to do that, and that was scary as well. But it just seemed like it was the best, the best solution for us to get out from under the big, that big rock that just seemed like it was holding us down. I think that our society does need to focus more on the United States, on us. And um, as far as, you know, I, I think a lot of the lower class get a lot more help from the government. <laughs> Since their insolvency, Amy spends hours every day looking for bargains in every available newspaper. Shopping has become a complicated and time-consuming undertaking. It is part of Jeff's and Amy's daily struggle to keep their heads above water. What would make me sleep better is where you're not taken from one thing to pay the other, you know, where you can just actually sit down and pay your bills and pay them and then still have money to get through the rest of the week with groceries and gas and, you know, stuff like that that you would need. I would be so happy just to have a typical week where I could sit down and write out the bills and then go, oh, you know what? We have money to get groceries this week. <laughs> there will be more women declared bankrupt in the U.S. this year than women obtaining a university degree. There will be more children in the U.S. this year with bankrupt parents than divorced parents. The most frequent New Year's resolution in the past five years has been paying off debts. Without a doubt, all this has a devastating impact on American society. What happened was that um, this, this gradual sh shift of, of the mythos moved from I will work and I will build and I, you know, I will be part of this to I'll hit the jackpot. Despite all this, a belief in the American dream still survives within some. Rob and Sarah Hamelman made it their ambition to grow wine in the Arizona desert. The bank refused to give them a loan for this new enterprise, but they managed to get enough money together to buy this vineyard with the help of family and friends. We have what it takes here to, for this to become a great vineyard. We have um, the high elevation, um, warm days, cool nights in the summer, uh, great free draining sandy loam soil. It's a great spot for a vineyard. After they had finished university, Jeff and Amy worked in vineyards all over the world. This year will be the first season on their own vineyard. I think it has been hard for people our age, but then um, kind of gives you something to work harder for. But is hard work really enough to fulfill your American dream these days? What are Sarah and Jeff hoping for? I would wish for America to have for the financial institutions and people in power to be more responsible to kind of think ahead of what their actions are doing. It seems like every, the things that led to the collapse were very short-sighted. Um, people weren't looking towards the consequences of their actions. Um, yeah, and just more um, financial opportunities, the banks to loosen up a little bit for people who want, who have dreams, who want to make it happen. 
Anthony Lascaris is more skeptical. 20 years ago, he emigrated from Greece. He is the manager of a bicycle shop with nine employees. In his opinion, the decline of the middle class is unstoppable. I mean, it's, it's really tempting to insist on protectionism and isolationism and thou shalt not import goods from overseas. But, but that, that doesn't really work. Everybody knows that. But man, is it tempting when, when we hear of the inequities and inequalities of workforces. It's very tempting to say, why do we permit our companies to import from countries that don't maintain the same labor controls and protections that we do at great expense? Even though globalized trade is highly criticized by many Americans, the USA is still outsourcing much of their manufacturing. We have no longer um, the right to expect to live a better life than our parents, and by extension, than everyone in the rest of the world. It's just not possible for the concentration of wealth to remain in one small society. I, I see it as an inevitable uh, consequence of, of uh, globalization that our standard of living must necessarily drop slightly in order for the rest of the world to rise. How will the struggle of the American middle class affect the nation's status in the world? The signs are everywhere that this is a country in crisis. We focus and tend to focus so much on the more uh, extreme left and right views and they seem to take the, uh, the spotlight all the time. And I think it's time that, you know, Americans, you know, the middle class, the, the Americans that represent this country the most have a voice heard in this country that, hey, you know, it's time for us to really start focusing on getting back to what made this country great, um, building, manufacturing, um, creating, inventing. That's what this country was, was built on, and we need to get back to that, I think. <laughs>